Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with a sinner's restless heart. our ushers to come forward as we pray this morning I would ask you to remember Elizabeth Kuhn she's recovering from leg surgery this week also want to remind you Jay Roberts passed away this week the good news is no more suffering he's home in heaven there will be a celebration of life service here next Saturday at noon in the sanctuary and they'll have visitation will start at 10 a.m. so to make you aware of that visitation will start at 10 a.m. and then the service will begin at noon here in the Sanctuary of Temple for Jay Roberts next Saturday. Let's ask God's blessings on the service, on the offering, on these needs today. Brother Johnny Carroll, would you pray for us, sir? Thank you. You can be seated. As they pass the offering, I'll go over a couple of announcements this morning. It's hard to believe we're in August already. The 1st of August, so if you notice in your bulletins, we do begin our surprise speakers for the fall season. That'll begin tonight at 6 o'clock, so you'll want to make sure you're here. I can't tell you who it is, but if you don't come, you'll be bad at me, and then I'll tell you you should have been here. 
but we have a good time. We do have some great speakers coming this fall, so you'll definitely want to be here. If you don't, you will miss it, I promise. So that starts tonight at 6 o'clock, our surprise speaker Sundays, the first Sunday of each month. Let's see, what else going on? Oh, next Sunday night at 6 o'clock will be our final family movie night of the summer. At 6 o'clock, we'll be watching Woodlawn. That'll be out in the gym, free popcorn and drinks. So I hope you'll come, just have a great time. Invite people to come with you to that. A good, good opportunity to bring friends, neighbors, co-workers. So that's next Sunday evening at 6 o'clock in the gym, watching the movie Woodlawn. A real good film. You'll be glad you came. Also, I'm just letting you know, I know it's early, but Sunday, September 11th, we're going to be having I'm a Part Sunday, kick off the fall season. I'm telling you this now so that if you need a T-shirt, if you've worn it out, lost it, whatever, we want everyone to wear their I'm a Part T-shirts that day. So if you need one, contact the church office. You can leave a message, and that way we'll put in an order, make sure we have T-shirts for that Sunday, September the 11th. That's our big kickoff Sunday. At 10 a.m. that day, that's our pastor's challenge. That'll be our I'm a part theme. At 11 will be communion. And then at 6 o'clock that evening will be our, sun, our choir celebration of praise. So just an exciting day kicking off the fall season. And like I said, I just want you to be aware of it now so that you can put it on your calendars and make sure you have a T-shirt for that day so that we can all be a part of what God's doing here at Temple. So we want everyone to be a part. At this time, we're going to work on our memory verses. We have them all in place now. So what we'll do through the remainder of August is we're just going to review them, try to help get them to stick, right, so we have it, so we can witness. Even if you don't have your Bible with you, you'll have God's Word that you can witness to someone from memory. So can we start, Chris, we're just going to go through them, we'll do them one, start very beginning, and we'll do, we'll just read through them one time until we read through all of them today. We'll start with the first one, so you ready? Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. All right, and then the next one, Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Good job. You know them now, right? Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then our next one is Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Then 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that... Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So I'm using Marty's inflection. He did that at 11. That helped me to remember that verse, right? Remember where to inflect your voice. All right, the next one. Mark 1, 15. And saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. All right, the next one, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then the next one, Romans 10, 9, and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the, with the heart, heart first, right? Heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then the last one in this series, Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Y'all did better than I did. Good job. So we'll keep reviewing these, and then I hope we'll go out and use them for the glory of God. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing with our praise team. Find 
of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more of heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hold my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark.
God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this opportunity to come and give you praise and worship. God, we're here because you are the only one who's worthy of the praise. God, we thank you for this time that we can come together. We thank you for the freedom to be in this place. I pray that you will uh, be in every aspect of this service, that everything that we do would be glorifying to you. God, I pray that you will speak through Pastor Steve, anoint him from on high, have your words spoken this morning, and open our hearts to hear what you have to say. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. you have your Bibles with you today, turn to Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1, if you don't know where that is, go to Matthew and turn left 400 years. Malachi chapter 1, before the message, Michelle Esterline comes to sing. Have you ever found yourself asking God where he's been? Ever get up out of bed thinking I can't do this again? Have you ever been afraid of what tomorrow brings? And you're facing it alone, at least that's what you think. I can tell you after going through the valley, even though I didn't see it at the time, it was in my weakest moments that he held me, and I know you'll find he will carry you when you can't go on. He'll be your strength when your strength is gone. He will lift you up. He will be enough to get you through. When the road is long and you want to quit Cause you think you've got nothing left to give You could fall apart, fall into his arms He will carry you Ever get the kind of news That you hoped you'd never hear Ever chase down a dream just to watch it disappear? Has somebody that you loved turned and walked away? And you're standing there alone with shattered faith. You don't have to pick up all the broken pieces. You don't have to try to cover up the scars. You are loved and you can always come to Jesus just as you are. He will 
will carry you when you can't go on. He'll be your strength when your strength is gone. He will lift you up. He will be enough to get you through. When the road is long and you want to quit, because you think you've got nothing left to give, you can fall apart right into his arms. He will carry you. His heart is never weary. No, he never gets tired. Through the toughest fight, through the longest night, through the flood and through the fire. He will carry you when you can't go on. He'll be your strength when your strength is gone. He will lift you up. He will be enough to get you through. When the road is long and you want to quit, because you think you've got nothing left to give, you can fall apart right into his arms. He will carry you. A Peanuts comic strip captured a conversation between Lucy and Charlie Brown. This is for you, Mitch. Lucy commented, Life is like a deck chair on a cruise ship. Some position their chair so they can see where they were. Others position their chair so they can see where they are. And others position their chair so they see that they are looking ahead. Then Charlie Brown said, I can't even get mine unfolded. When we come to the book of Malachi, we look back on around 4,000 years of history based on the genealogies that we see in the Bible, but also we're looking at the present time around 400 B.C., and we're looking forward to a little over 2,000 years into the future where we are today. A significant little book here. It's a minor prophet, and they're called minor prophets not because of their importance, but because of their length. So it's a short prophet, it's prophecy. But it's a very important prophecy and it's very relevant even for us today. Now, I'm going to have to give kind of a lengthy background leading into this, uh, this book of Malachi because right away at the beginning, God tells Israel, I love you. Now, he tells us that, doesn't he? Child of God here today, I love you. And their response is, really? Hmm. That's going to require some background, isn't it? Is that our response to God when he says, I love you? But think about where the nation of Israel has come, where they had been. We come to this book. Nothing is really known about Malachi other than what is revealed in this book. His name appears nowhere else in Scripture. Unlike most of the other prophets, Malachi tells us nothing about his family background or even the historical setting in which he ministers. So really all we know for certain about Malachi is his name. And the meaning of his name is very significant. Malachi means my messenger. He's the prophet of God, the spokesman of God, the messenger of God. As God's messenger, it's a fact that is confirmed by what he writes in verse 1. He says, the word of the Lord. Like all scripture, these words were penned by a human author, right? But it wasn't the human author that's speaking. This is whose word? God's word. And he used many different authors to pen the word, but it's God's word, and it's alive today. So he's using Malachi to give God's message to the nation of Israel, but also even to us today. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit, and these are the words of God. We come to a time that's after the return from exile to Jerusalem, around 435 B.C. The remnant of the people had returned to Jerusalem and the surrounding countryside in the time of Ezra, uh, after 70 years of captivity by the Babylonians. So you got to remember, they had just come out of captivity for 70 years. 
Jeremiah had prophesied the 70 years exactly. Daniel had recognized from the book of Jeremiah that the time had come and God raised up just the right king, Darius the Mede, for the hour. Babylon had been taken over by the Medes and Persians at that point in time. That is why Darius was then the king in Babylon. Eventually, the people were allowed to return to Jerusalem. The first group to return was under the leadership of Zerubbabel, and during the ministry of the prophet Haggai, they laid the foundations of the temple. The temple was completed in 516 B.C. during the ministry of Zechariah. It's neat how all this ties together, right, in the minor prophets. You get a picture of what's happening here in Israel as they return to Jerusalem. Ezra led a second group of people back to Jerusalem in 458 B.C. There was a great revival that took place as Ezra called people back to the word of God and reestablished the temple worship. A third group returns under the leadership of Nehemiah in 445 B.C. for the purpose of rebuilding the walls of this city. Ezra and Nehemiah had provided godly and skilled leadership in the restoring of the temple and the walls of Jerusalem. Opposition had been overcome as God had caused successive Medo-Persian kings to look at the Jews in a positive way. Now, just one generation, about 20 years, that's all it takes, one generation after Nehemiah and the prophets of his day, the people and the priests of the Jewish people had both become very lax in serving God. One generation. They took temple worship to be something to do just any old way. What a major sin. It was an indicator of their whole backslidden approach to God and to life. The books given through Moses had outlined very clear requirements. They're not just guidelines, they were the law, right? Regarding animal sacrifices, the animals had to be without defects. They had to represent a sacrifice of the owner's time, feed, and care. Stolen animals were an abomination to God. Vowing to sacrifice a certain animal and then substitute an inferior one was not acceptable to God, yet many of the people were doing these very things. The priests had to be honest. They had to prepare themselves to perform the sacrifices in exacting ways. These priests were not measuring up to God's requirements. In addition, there were other sins besides robbing God going on. There was the marrying of heathen again. There was sorcery. There was the divorcing of innocent wives. God sought to reason with the people and the priests through Malachi by posing a series of questions and answers, which, while also clearly exposing their sin. The internal evidence in the book of Malachi makes it likely that it was written during the period that Nehemiah had returned to Persia. The temple worship was an operation, so it had to be after the rebuilding of the temple. The sins that Malachi deals with are similar to ones Nehemiah addresses upon his return to Jerusalem. So let's start reading Malachi chapter 1. We'll read verse 1 through 5 today. Malachi chapter 1, starting at verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob. And I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness, Whereas Edom saith, We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall build, but I will throw down. They shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, The Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. So if you could tell already, it's going to get heavy in a hurry, isn't it? The book of Malachi is a heavy book. He's warning of the coming judgment of God. We must choose, right? Do you want the blessings of God or the cursings of God? From the beginning of the book to the end of the book, that's about what it boils down to, right? Do you want the blessings of God or the cursings of God? As we're going to see in the book of Malachi, the cursings of God is an awful place to be. That's not where we want to be. We want the blessings of God on our lives. So as we come here to Malachi chapter 1, Verse 1, Malachi is ministering during a time when God's people had become lukewarm in their relationship with him. That's one of the most terrible places to be. God says either get hot or get cold. But what does he say? If you're lukewarm, he's going to spew you out of his mouth. He can't stand it to be lukewarm. Although the temple worship is back in operation once again, we see that the people are really just going through the motions. 
So Malachi, just like his contemporary Nehemiah, he addresses the sins of Israel. If we come to verse 1, it says, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. The burden of the word of the Lord. It's a heavy message today. Notice it's the word of the Lord. He says to Israel, not against Israel. That is because God's love for his people and his desires to see them return to him with all their heart. That's always God's desire, is for us to return to him, serve him with all of our heart. If we've grown cold, if we've grown lukewarm, if we go through the motions of worship, God's call is always to restore, restore, restore. That's his desire. Now, it may take judgment. It may take some awful things for that to happen. But his goal, his desire is to restore, restoration, draw us back. That's what he's trying to warn his children of Israel here. Come back to me. Wake up. Pay attention to what you're doing. It was only one generation away, less than 20 years, from a church that was on fire, right? The temple worship under Ezra, how they were on fire for the Lord, back in Jerusalem, praising God. But you got to remember that they had felt, dealt a, a pretty rough hand, right? We're blessed here, so it's easy for us to look back and go, what is wrong with Israel? Well, what was wrong with Israel? They had just been in captivity for 70 years. As they were released from captivity, they come back by small groups to Jerusalem. And what do they find when they get to Jerusalem? The temple's destroyed. The city's destroyed. Even the walls of the city are destroyed. So they go back to rebuilding them. But certainly at this point, it's not like it was before. You look at the old temple of Solomon versus the new temple that they're building. Not nearly the grandeur or splendor. As a matter of fact, it was much later that the temple was fixed up by Herod, right? Many years later. So this was just a small temple. It was simple compared to what they used to under Solomon. The city had been destroyed. They were trying to rebuild it. They were uh, oppressed on all sides. They were still being oppressed. They had the Medo-Persians over them still, even though they weren't in captivity. They still answered to this governor. So they had all of these things. They were in the midst of a drought. There was a famine going on. A lot of difficulty facing them. So when God comes to them, he tells them in verse 2, he says, I have loved you, saith the Lord. It's interesting their response to them. Their response is he says, I have loved you, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Kind of a powerful statement, isn't it? Is the main problem here is that Israel was focusing on their circumstances, not on God's love for them. He told them that he loved them, and their response basically is, how have you loved us? They had been in captivity, everything had been destroyed, they're trying to rebuild, it's just a former shadow of the former glory that was there. It's easy to look around at the circumstances that we live in and wonder how things could be like this if God really loved us. Like going to someone diagnosed with cancer or serious illness, telling them God loves them. It is true, God does not quit loving us because of our circumstances. Many times humans fail each other in times of crisis, but God never fails. Aren't you thankful? God loves you. Have you found yourself more focused on the circumstances of life than the fact that God loves you? Charles Stanley said, God allows adversity in our life to turn our attention to him. While it can be painful to endure, it leads us into a deeper relationship with him and saves us from future destruction. If you hear the Lord pounding through adversity in your life, respond quickly by opening the door to him. In those darkest times of our lives, many times that's when we have the closest relationship with him. Because all the other things get stripped away, right? All the other distractions get pulled away. All we have is him and he's enough. Child of God here today, I might not know what you're facing even today or this coming week, but I do know that God never fails and that he loves you. That's what he tells us in his word. His promise is he loves you. Whatever we may face this week, we can be assured that God loves us. The problem is we tend to think of love and hate in terms of our emotions, right? God's love and hate is not about emotions, but rather about his sovereign choice. That is a major problem even in marriages today. 
Couples think love is an emotion. Emotions come and go, right? Love doesn't. Godly love is not an emotion that comes and goes. God's love is a choice that is committed no matter the circumstances. May we love our spouses with the unconditional love of God. Love and hate are an act of God's will. I always explain this concept to young couples in premarital counseling. Love is a choice. It is a commitment. Don't come to me later telling me you don't love that person anymore. We hear that all the time. Because what you're really saying is I choose to not love that person. Due to selfish worldly emotions, not godly commitment. I am so thankful that God loves me with his unconditional love. And may I show that kind of love to my wife and my family and others. The main point that God is making here in Malachi is that his love for Israel is completely undeserved. Think about that. Do we deserve the love of God? What have I done to deserve the love of God? What have you done to deserve the love of God? What did Israel done to deserve the love of God? It is certainly undeserved. The principle is demonstrated both in the personal lives, as we're going to see here, of Jacob and Esau, in the history of the nations that developed from their descendants. Look at verse 2. He says, I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I love Jacob. So he asks him the question. He says, I love you. And they say, Wherein have you loved us? How could you love us? Prove it. And God said, Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Saith the Lord, Yet I loved Jacob. Jacob and Esau were twin brothers. As the older brother, though, Esau would have normally been the one to have earned the birthright and the blessing. But even before the boys were born, God revealed that it was his sovereign choice that Jacob and his descendants would be the recipients of God's blessings. What had Jacob done to earn that blessing? Nothing, right? Genesis 25, verse 23 says, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb. Two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. Before they were even born, God told them that the, young, the older would serve the younger. God had made the choice even before they were born, and neither one of them had done anything right or wrong. God's sovereign choice to love Jacob did not depend on human will or performance, but was completely dependent solely on God's grace. We sang about the grace of God this morning. Oh, what an awesome thing, the grace of God. We clearly see here the idea that God's love is a matter of his sovereign choice and not a matter of emotion. We come to verse 3, he says, And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Pretty strong language here, right? He hated Esau. Once again, we need to keep in mind that God's hate is not a matter of emotion, but rather of his sovereign choice. We also need to note that in Hebrew, thought the idea of love and hate is often used as hyperbole to express a contrast between choices. Remember when Jesus used the idea of love and hate when he spoke the words in Luke 14, 26? He said, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children, and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Well, Jesus is obviously not teaching us to hate our family. That would violate a lot of other scripture, wouldn't it? But what he is pointing out is that loving him means making a choice to prefer him even over our human relationships. So when God says that he hates Esau, he is saying that he made a sovereign choice to choose Jacob over Esau. For most of us, our immediate reaction to that sovereign choice is what? That's not fair, right? What if you were Esau? That doesn't sound fair, does it? But in reality, what is not fair is that God chose to love Jacob. Think about that for a minute. Did you get that? What's not fair is that God chose to love Jacob. Jacob and Esau deserve the eternal punishment of God, right? Because of sin. We all deserve the eternal punishment of God because of sin. Aren't you thankful for the love of God? Amen. It's not fair that we get to go to heaven, right? Fair would be for us to go to hell for all of eternity, but for the love and the grace of God. And I'm thankful for that today. 
He provided the way of salvation through Jesus Christ. He's making a choice here. He chooses to love Jacob. He chooses Israel to be his chosen people. Then we come to, well, at the end of verse 3 there, he says, I hated Esau, laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. And the dragons there of the wilderness, literally the word means like jackals or destructive animals. Something to be without God's protection. What an awful place to be, right? Over and over throughout the Psalms, we consider the refuge of God, our place of safety and security. Imagine being outside of God's protection, his provision. What an awful place to be. Yet that's what it's going to be like for all of eternity for those who reject Jesus Christ. You're going to be outside of God's protection and provision. There's going to be destruction and despair. What an awful day that's going to be. We come to verse 4 of Malachi chapter 1. He says, Whereas Edom saith, and Edom, these are the descendants of Esau, Edom saith, we are impoverished. But what are we going to do? We will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. What a proud thing, right? We will rebuild. Okay, God, you want to be against us? I'll just do it myself. Well, how far is that attitude going to get us in life, right? Trouble. I'm so thankful God's on my side, right? Or I'm on God's side, however you want to look at that. To be against God would be an awful thing to be. That's why he points out, that's why he gives us this example of the Edomites. We don't want to be against God. We want to be on his side. Notice he says, they shall build, but I will throw down. They shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. I don't want to be on that side. I don't be on the Edomite side. Amen. I don't be the Israelite side. I don't be on God's side. The choice we have to make. What a thought. What an awful place to be against God without hope forever then we come to verse 5 and your eyes shall see and ye shall say the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel your eyes shall see you will witness these truths have we not seen God's miraculous hand at work even here at Temple Baptist Church Even in our own lives, as we look back, have we not seen God's miraculous hand of provision, protection, his hand at work, even on our undeserving behalf? It should cause us to declare, as Malachi did, the Lord will be magnified, exalted, lifted up. He is worthy of praise and worship. That's the main reason we've gathered today, is to worship the one who is worthy of our worship. It's all about him. It's all about what he's done. Because he loved us, because of his grace and his mercy. We have salvation in Jesus Christ. We have hope today. Your eyes shall see, you will witness this truth. Jacob and the nation of Israel are both completely undeserving of God's love. Today we are completely undeserving of God's love. But he loved them anyway. God loves us anyway. Child of God here today, God loves you. Even if it may not feel like it is you're struggling through life. But be assured, God loves you and he cares for you. He is the one that is able to meet your needs. Maybe you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior. God loves you. Yes, even you living in sin, God loves you. One of our verses we're studying, Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how much he loved you. That's how much he loved me. That even while we were sinners, he allowed his son to die to pay the penalty for our sin. And then one of the most famous or easily recognized verses in all of Scripture, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. To everyone listening to the sound of my voice today, God loves you. Not because we deserve it, but because he chooses to. Thank you, God, for choosing to love me. May we go out and tell someone else about the love of God. Not because we deserve it, but because of his grace and his mercy. Whatever we face this coming week, we can know that God loves us. Even to those who reject him, even those who hate him, he loves them. He's provided the way of salvation. He's provided hope 
if we would just receive him. Oh, the love of God. Let's stand as we close in prayer today. Our Father in heaven, as we bow before you today, Lord, I do thank you for your love, for your grace, for your mercy. Not that we deserve it, not that we've done anything to attain it. Oh, it's all about you today. I thank you as we've gathered into your house this morning to worship you, to study your word, how you reveal yourself to us. We thank you for it. Lord, I pray for each one of us that's here this morning. I pray that everyone in this room knows you as their Savior. If not, Lord, may today be the day of salvation. May they come and we'll show them from God's word how they can be saved today. Lord, for the children of God here today, how we need to be reminded of your love, your care for us. Even in the difficult times of life, sometimes it may not feel like you love us, but Lord, we know because of your promises and your word, no matter what comes and what, what circumstances we may face, you love us. You'll always be there with us. You never leave us. You never forsake us. Help us to hold on to that hope that we would be salt and light to those around us, no matter what we may face, that, Lord, we would be servants of yours that would be salt and light to the world around us. So bless us as we go, for we ask in Jesus' name, amen.